My name is Franny and welcome everyone to Liquid Margins. This is social annotation online and on campus. And today's guests are Mary Isbell. She's Associate Professor of English and Director of First Year Writing. And uh, sorry, I neglected to put your university um, and not on my game this morning. So uh, it's International Professor of English. <laughs> professor of English. Okay. I'm at the University of New Haven. Oh, New Haven, University of New Haven, right. I yeah. should have known that off the top of my head, sorry. Um, I, I think my, this might be decap by accident. I don't know what's going on. Uh, we also have John Stewart, and he is the Assistant Director, Office of Digital Learning at the University of Oklahoma. And then our moderator today is Jeremy Dean. He's VP of Education at Hypothesis. And um, I, we also have a couple other colleagues from Hypothesis here, Becky George and Nate Angel and myself. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy and he's sure to do a better job than I've just done. So, but anyway, happy Friday. Thanks for being here. You're doing great as always, Franny. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I know both Mary and John from before the pandemic. Um, this this uh, session is called Social Annotation Inside and Outside the or Off Campus and On Campus. But the secret title is, you know, like Social Annotation, it's not just for pandemics. And we know each other from uh, before the pandemic. I've met you both in person. We've both we've presented together. Um, do you guys know each other? Have you met before, Mary and John? No, I don't think so. No. Okay. Well, you're two of the oldest school advocates of, of hypothesis at different different corners of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mary has been using hypothesis probably since before we had a learning management system integration, I think, um, across two different LMSs now at the University of New Haven from Blackboard to Canvas. Mm -hmm. um, and John, uh, certainly before the LMS as well, I remember we integrate you guys integrated hypothesis with WordPress there. You're enough of a developer that I know you helped us start to explore certain ways of viewing data even before we, we had kind of dashboards for users and stuff like that. So you both have been around a long time with Hypothesis, which is why we've invited you here today. And I'm, I'm very happy to see you. How, how have you been? Mary, you wanna just share a little how you've been? Yeah, last year and I, a half? I've, um, <laughs> I'm surviving. I'm, I'm joining you from uh, my mother's apartment attached to my home where my two children are over here. Hopefully we won't hear them screaming. I feel like that's an important part of sharing how I'm doing. I, I don't yeah. have daycare still. <laughs> um, the semester is almost over and I'm very excited about spring and summer. Um, so yeah, I'm doing great though. John, how yeah, are you doing? Same, about the same for me. My daughter's uh, right behind me eating lunch already. And uh, <laughs> um, I've been home with her for you know a year now and uh, just feed her constantly and do dishes and then occasionally get to work on school stuff. So John, you've been working from home this whole time? Yeah, I had been all calendar year 2020. Uh, this year, I've actually been back in the classroom and I've been using Hypothesis face-to-face -face this semester. Um, so that's been interesting, um, you know, in addition to, to all the times in the past. And Mary, are you, um, are you, have you been going to campus to teach? No, so um, our situation made remote teaching the smartest choice since we were trying not to expose my mom to the virus. Um, so I taught remotely for this entire year. And actually the spring semester, I wasn't teaching because of maternity leave. So I hit the ground running in the fall, but I wasn't part of the, the crisis of the last spring. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been all remote and Hypothesis um, has helped a lot with that actually. Um, so congratulations. You've had a, 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 a child during this uh, crazy year and a half. Yes, I have. He's almost 16 months old. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, I wanted to start off by reading this quote uh, that I actually got uh, turned to by Joshua Kim in his regular column in uh, Inside Higher Ed. Um, it's a quote from uh, Peter Bryant, who's a professor and associate dean at the University of Sydney Business School, and a blog that he talks about what he calls the snapback. Um, you know, <laughs> Personally, familiarly, 
uh, all different, you know, athletically, maybe academically, professionally, there's a lot of desire to return to normalcy, right? I actually just got my second shot this morning. I'm feeling fine so far. Um, and so I'm excited, you know, the person who gave me the shot asked, like, do you have any travel plans this summer? And I was like, well, I don't know. I sure would like to go to Maine and, and visit my family and go to Minnesota and visit my wife's family, but I don't know. But we do have this desire to return to normalcy. And he calls that the snapback. Um, and then what he's trying to do in the blog is kind of ask us to pause and reflect on what we've learned during this time that might stay with us beyond the pandemic. You know, like uh, maybe the N95s, we can at some point burn them. I think probably not, um, but you know, certain things we will stop doing, but certain things, you know, uh, make sense. Actually, I was standing there in line today for, for the shot and I was looking at the stickers, you know, the six feet distance stickers. And I was just thinking like, everybody who's been alive at this time is gonna know like, six feet really clear in their head you know they've just been standing at six feet distance for so long it's going to be a measurement that we just kind of automatically recognize um, i want to read this quote and then we'll uh, turn into this more of a conversation we need a better story to tell about what we have learned in our liminal year year or two this isn't about case studies conference papers or vendor demonstrations it's about knowing the human impact of what we have all been doing it is understanding the affordances of a horrible situation and knowing what we have learned from experience and telling those stories to the right people at the right time. And hoping we can sort of participate in that uh, today. Um, I saw a post this morning, a, a, a Twitter post um, by Paul Manson, who's a visiting professor at Reed. And he says, tools I've used during the pandemic that I want to keep. And it's got some checklists. I don't know how you do this in Twitter, but it's an in-class chat software, allow them all to speak in ways that work for them. Uh, Zoom office hours, lower barrier to check in, and then uh, thirdly, online reading discussion tool hypothesis for sure. Um, what tools have you, and I would say tools and practices, what tools and practices have you discovered or rediscovered over the past uh, year um, that you feel like will be part of your repertoire when you, we hope, return to normalcy? Uh, Mary, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so I, I think I, we did transition to Canvas in the summer before this academic year. So um, some, a lot of things I've changed had to do with transitioning into both using Canvas and teaching remote synchronous. Um, Hypothesis was one thing that I was now using inside the LMS. Um, and so I think I, I, I upped my game in certain places there using Canvas. Um, I developed a couple of uh, new strategies to have students return back to the annotations that they'd made. Um, another tool that I'll throw in the mix though would be any sort of collaborative writing environment. Um, I switched um, after taking an excellent course on data code and ethics uh, during the digital, digital pedagogy lab. Um, I made this switch away from Google Docs, <laughs> I'll share that here, um, and transitioned into using our own university's uh, Microsoft OneDrive system to use shared Word Online documents. Um, either way, um, I had always used them to do one-off revision workshop activities um, in class, but what happened this year is I just created one document that we used all year and the new content went up at the top. And the way I was using that was in tandem with hypothesis. I was having students pull things that they had cited and talked about in the social annotation space, pull them into the shared document, um, and then use that as the space where we communicated with each other. And I, it felt so frustrating at first to not see their faces until I adjusted my expectations about why cameras weren't on and, and all the reasons that one might feel exhausted by having Zoom on, even if one were in the perfect circumstances. Um, that I started to just say hello at the beginning and then everybody's cameras were off and we were in this shared document and then cameras would come back on at the end. And that has proven so productive. We get so much done, so much synchronous discussion happening um, that I, I've really enjoyed that and I'm gonna keep it. Um, I'll stop there for now. I'm sure more will come up. Yeah, I really like that idea of the, um, the shared uh, notepad, the shared you know, uh, class notes. Um, I haven't tried it before with just a single document for a whole class, but yeah, I was doing similar stuff with my class in, uh, in Google Docs, um, having uh, shared notes for each week, usually. Um, and uh, for me, that's part of how Hypothesis sort of fits into to what I'm trying to do is shared note taking and um, thinking out loud uh, more broadly. 
And so the other piece of that for me is um, uh, blogs. Um, and so I've got my students uh, set up um, a blog with each of them and, um, and they blog weekly. Um, either, what I did was I gave them sort of an assignment bank and I said, choose from any of these prompts, um, reflecting on what we were talking about this week, uh, bringing in outside sources or outside um, articles that they read, um, talking about their favorite um, music or movie or anything else that they're engaging with. Um, or you know, about a half dozen other uh, prompts each week and just trying to get them to think about how what we're talking about in class um, relates to the rest of their world uh, and, and reflects their own interests in the broader world. So um, that's been the, the main space for me. But yeah, I see, I see all of these tools as doing the same work of thinking out loud and, uh, and trying to connect um, in class with, with authentic learning. Um, I was gonna ask what is the class you're teaching that you were describing that work in? Oh, sure, sorry, yeah, and, and we introduced me as uh, assistant director for an office of digital learning, which is my job, but um, right now, I, I also teach history, and so right now I'm teaching oh. a history of science class um, where we're using hypothesis, and so it's an intro to history of science, and we've actually been talking a lot about public health this semester, because uh, obviously, and, um, and then the other class that I'm teaching, we're not using hypothesis in this other one, but um, a, a lot of similar work is uh, uh, on the history of the Tulsa race massacre, which is coming up on its 100 year anniversary on um, uh, May 1st uh, of this year. And so um, anyway, I can talk more about that if, if anybody's interested in the history, if you don't know the story, but um, both those classes have been really interesting. Yeah, and, and one thing you're, you're reminding me of is that other piece of that writing for the public, writing for a real audience. Um, did you, uh, which blogging platform were you having your students use? Could they choose or what were they doing? Yeah, so we, uh, we have a domain of one's own uh, initiative here at OU where everybody can have their own uh, domain space and build whatever kind of websites they want to. Um, for my class, I was encouraging them strongly to use WordPress. And so um, each student has their own uh, full WordPress site uh, set up. And then um, we use Canvas as our LMS. And so they can submit their blog posts into Canvas. And then it brings it into the grader for me. And I can use the grader just to see really? what they've I done. As an assignment type, you can ask for a URL submission, and so it brings it all in. Um, so that's been really nice. Um, I um, have um, installed, uh, an, well, I've, I've got an installation going at the University of New Haven of Open Lab, which is Commons in a Box, but customized by City Tech. Um, you may all be familiar with the sort of that, and, and it's because I so want to be a domain of one's own campus, and we can't. This is this it does allow students to create their own. Um, projects and associated WordPress sites, but it also means that I get to create a WordPress site for my class and students can join as members. And um, so a lot of, um, I was experimenting for the first time really with that as well, having students turn projects into public facing work, which was great. Yeah, it's been a big part of what I've um, wanted to do with all of my classes for years now is just um, no disposable sort of assignments. Right. I, I don't like, you know, marking something up with a red pen and giving it back. And so, you know, having them think about who their audience is, having them write for each other and having them comment on each other's. We don't actually use comments in the blogs anymore, but we use hypothesis and we use uh, some other stuff to, you know, give feedback. Um, but yeah, that idea of, uh, you know, talk to, talk to your parents, talk to your roommates, talk to uh, just the broader world um, rather than to me. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I think we're on the same page on that front. And I actually have thoughts about that when you have hypothesis what do you do with the comments tool? I don't find students gravitating to use it um, on their blog posts, even potentially not making them, like not turning it on. You can turn it off on each blog post. So um, yeah, really interesting. We're, we're hoping to eventually be more deeply integrated with both those versions of WordPress so that your Canvas you know, hypothesis login will work across those, those platforms. Um, I'm wondering if each of you can reach back into your, you know memories about what first attracted you to social annotation or hypothesis and talk a little bit about that and then also how your practice maybe has changed or evolved over the past year. Uh, you hinted at this, uh, Mary, in terms of returning to annotations, um, but John, maybe we can start with you this time about what first interested in social annotation and if and how your practice with annotation in the classroom has, has changed over the past year during the pandemic. Yeah, it's a similar story, sort of returning to, um, to what I'd been doing a little bit in the past. Um, one of the things about history of science is that it's a smaller field of history. 
Um, we don't have textbooks in the same way that, you know, an American history course does or a European history course does. And so while there are books that are commonly used, a lot of our resources that we give to students are um, articles or other online resources. And so, um, you know, one of the challenges of hypothesis is that it doesn't work as well with a physical textbook, but that's just not a, a thing in my field. And so all of the assignments that I gave to my students this semester were either PDFs or, or um, you know, web posts, blogs, articles on NPR or whatever. And so everything was annotatable uh, as far as our readings go. And so it just was a, a normal fit for me. It was a, it was a really logical use case uh, for me. And that was one of the things that first attracted me to Hypothesis is it just works really well in my space. Um, and, uh, and this semester, um, it had that same function. The other thing I like about it and the other way that I've used Hypothesis in the past is sort of as a curation tool. So it's great for annotation, obviously. And I think that's the, the main way people think of it. Um, but as I'm going through and just reading things and coming across whatever in my daily practice, I can, um, you know, leave a comment and sort of collect that thing for myself. And, uh, and remember, um, I came across one article on NPR where they were talking about uh, genetic splicing of humans and um, uh, apes of various sorts. Uh, and they're looking to be able to grow human organs basically on monkeys. We had just been talking about the island of Dr. Moreau in my class, um, which has the same themes. And, um, and so I read that immediately thought of the prior days, you know, discussion and uh, marked it and then passed it on to my students. And I had that sort of experience on a nearly weekly basis throughout the semester of just being able to um, pull things into my class and uh, encouraging the students to do the same. I love that. Not, not a disposable tool for you either, right? As, as, an, as a scholar, as a teacher, something you're using and then uh, connecting it with your, with your teaching as well. Mary, what about you? What first attracted you to the hypothesis or social annotation and how's your practice evolved, especially over the past year in the new teaching and, uh, context? Um, yeah, so what attracted me to hypothesis, I wanted something like hypothesis to exist before it did. I feel like I was, I had as a graduate student um, encountered in you know, teaching first year writing courses, I was also um, serving in sort of a graduate student leadership role in, in the uh, first year writing office. And um, I was frustrated by the anthologies that we often used um, when teaching our composition courses. We had two courses then, um, and I think they still do at UConn. One is you, you learn writing um, through nonfiction and one you learn writing through literature, quote unquote. Um, and when we, would when we would teach that other course, you would often choose an intro to literature anthology or some kind of textbook that gathered together readings for students. Um, and I was always frustrated by the apparatus of those um, anthologies. The apparatus got in the way of what I wanted students to do with them. They presented literature as content to be mastered, you know, um, certain kinds of um, literary techniques needed to be learned and regurgitated. And that just got in the way. So um, I worked on creating an anthology with my colleagues, my fellow graduate students, and that anthology, um, I, I won't go into the details, but I worked on trying to publish something um, that you know would pull it all together nicely, but have the apparatus we wanted. And it wound up, despite our bef best efforts, costing a ton of money. And it was so frustrating because I knew that all these, most of the readings we wanted to choose, some were under copyright and that was a different story, but most of the readings we wanted to choose were in the public domain and it shouldn't have cost anything. And there should have been a way for us to be able to give students a way to engage. So I first was using um, Annotation Studio that I learned about that MIT had developed. And that's actually what led me to meeting Jeremy and learning about um, Hypothesis. And so, for me, it became this will be my non anthology way of gathering readings and it, it worked really well. I always wanted students to read and respond. My my goal in the writing classroom, at least, is to have students engage on the level that they want to engage. So what surprises you, shocks you, any reaction you have, my goal is to teach them how to take that and use it to develop an original arguable claim and to recognize that the thing they think can develop into something exciting to say, not just wait to figure out what everyone says in class to figure out what the right answer is. Um, so I've been using it that way. And the, the way things are changing now that I'm really excited about actually is 
I'm starting to realize that that can be the first step toward collaboratively creating an addition with my students for future students. So this, all things are kind of meshing together, um, but this idea of, I don't want disposable assignments. I want the writing that my students produce to wind up somewhere is coming together with annotation so that I'm kind of thinking now, not kind of, I, I am <laughs> pursuing a project where um, students will write initial annotations in hypothesis, revise them in hypothesis, and then submit a formal assignment, which is a sort of um, focused annotations in a particular area that they think will improve our classroom edition. And then during the summer or the winter break, I'll incorporate that into an edition that moves forward. And it won't, that then won't be in hypothesis, it'll be in the actual text. Um, and so that's a big thing that hypothesis has facilitated. I wouldn't have thought about things in that way um, without it. And it's gonna be an important tool to develop it for sure. Are you thinking about centralizing those texts that the students um, collect into sort of a, a digital anthology? Or are you thinking about leaving them sort of spread out all over the web, but then using yeah. hypothesis to like string it together in a, in a web? I like, I like that question. My, the project started thinking I'll be making an anthology. Um, and I was thinking about it in terms of, some of you might've come across this um, initiative at Purdue called Cornerstone uh, Living for Learning. It's an initiative to, um, it's NEH and Teagle funded, and it captured humanities professors' attention across the country for sure, because it was, here's funding to develop an integrated core curriculum experience in the humanities for schools that have um, pre-professional programs primarily. And that's our instance at, at the University of New Haven. I teach core courses to students who are not English majors. So I got really excited about that program and part of their program at Purdue at least has a set of transformative texts. And so my initial idea um, was to develop an anthology of transformative texts that we determined together we would work with. And as I thought more and more about it, I realized my pedagogical, my, my approach to texts says it's not so much about what the text tells you, it's about what you do to the text. And so an anthology says these are the things we find valuable for whatever reason, even if they're troubling or what have you. Um, so just long answer to your <laughs> very simple question. I'm thinking more that it's distributed and I'm actually thinking that I'm one person creating additions with my students, but the project's morphing into being more, here are the resources that any instructor can use to create additions with their students. And there will be a, a hub to sort of share additions if people want to make them available to others to use. Um, but mostly my dream would be that people would get the bug and start thinking of editing as a, a collaborative effort to undertake with their students. I'm wondering if you guys have uh, noticed any difference in how your students have responded to hypothesis during the pandemic. Um, you know, when you've taught with hypothesis in the past, they probably still met face to face and got to socialize and connect and converse, discuss course uh, content then. But when we remove some of the more, you know, the social aspects of teaching and learning, if you are teaching face to face, did you find students more open to the tool or more dependent on it in any way? I was just going to say, even going back to face to face this semester, the students are still um, making connections in uh, hypothesis that it, they don't get to make in the face to face classroom um, just because of social distancing. Um, and I think even without the social distancing, they see each other's comments in the readings and, and respond and start having conversations there um, with someone that they might not have talked to you know, prior in the semester. Um, or someone they might not have connected with. And so I think, um, I, I do like that hypothesis, I like that, that there's no um, avatar, I guess, in hypothesis, that you don't necessarily, you know, know what the other person looks like or, or who they are necessarily in the class. And so there's no preconceived notions and you're just responding to the thoughts. Um, and yeah. so as a, as a social media tool in that way, um, I like that the conversations there are sort of, um, have a different context, I guess, than what they're having in the classroom. Yeah, grounded. Yeah, that's great. Mary. Um, I, what I used to do in the in-person classroom was have them all annotate and then I would kind of gather some notes of what I was noticing. And then the beginning of class was, okay, these are some threads, let's go. And then they would, it would almost be like that avatar would meet the person and they would <laughs> say, oh, that was you saying that. And that was you saying that. And that would sort of make it come alive. Um, and 
that, you know, that didn't happen in the same way, but um, because I would have them move from hypothesis into pulling the thing they, mo so they might annotate 15, 20 passages in a reading that we were doing, but I'd ask them to go back through what they'd looked at and pick two that they really wanted to sort of share what they thought about it. And that then goes in the sort of shared word online document space. And there their names show up, what they're putting is under their names and they start to comment on each other. And that's the live activity during class. And um, yeah, it's not the same as in person, um, but it's still, I think had them start to develop this or recognize the personalities of what was being pulled out, I guess. Mary, can you say more about this assignment in terms of, so I, I've annotated 15 times in a text, and then the next step is to grab my referent and my annotation and bring that into the Microsoft uh, Word space. So yeah. it would be some of the original text, my comment, mm -hmm. and then I say more, I like elaborate. Yeah, elaborate. Uh, basically, it wasn't even so much, uh, I gave them the option to sort of say again what they said in their annotation, but I would frame the discussion in a certain way after having looked at how that so for an example I was using this not in a composition course this activity. Um, but for a, a course on review writing the art of the review, um, you know reviewing films reviewing television shows, etc, so we would read reviews that we decided on together. We found a, a review of John Mulaney's comedy, Netflix special. So they'd all read it and annotated it with hypothesis. And then in class, I wanted them to isolate some moves that the critic was making in writing about Mulaney. So they would under their name, share a quote and then identify what they thought the, the rhetorical move was that mm -hmm. the author was making. And then the next step of the activity was for them to respond to each other. Um, and that's where the d discussion got cool, right? Because the comments in the document was where the back and forth was happening and everyone's together. So there's, there's hypothesis um, annotations as homework where they may be in the document at the same time or not. And there's also hypothesis annotations live during class, which I had also done. And this kind of brought pieces of that together, but because they were all in there together, all the typings happening at once, I, it, it made up for the fact that I didn't see faces on screens mm. and there's, there was action. That's super cool. One strand that I'm hearing here is that I, that I really like is just the idea that an annotation isn't an end in itself, that you know it's the beginning of something that con continues in face-to-face -face class time or in some you know, more collaborative authoring tool like you're describing, Mary. Um, uh, that's, that's really cool. I wanna open it up to our guests and also to, or to our audience and to uh, also to my colleagues, if you have any questions about um, what Mary and John have said. The, the crowd has been a little quiet today in the chat. <laughs> People have been uh, commenting about how much they want to take classes with these folks because the classes sound so interesting. Um, and we don't have any active questions, but uh, I know you probably have some more of your own, Jeremy. I, I have some as well, um, but, but I'll let you go first. I mean, let me just get the, get the sound bite in there. Like, uh... Social annotation, is it just for pandemics? I mean, hypothesis over the last year has seen tremendous growth, tremendous adoption. A lot of new schools have gotten, you guys have been around forever and, uh, and you know, University of New Haven is actually one of our first customers. Um, Oklahoma is now piloting for the first time, um, but there's a decision coming up for, for, for at Oklahoma, right? Should you guys subscribe? And I have to put in the context of your specific school, but there's a lot of decision makers and, 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 and teachers themselves that are sort of deciding, with this snapback, with the return to normal, now that I can go into face-to-face -face and see my students, for those that teach face-to-face, -face, um, do I need tools like this? Um, I'm assuming the answer is yes, but I guess the question, the, the follow-up is why? <laughs> and if you say, if you want to say no, you can, but. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's all always been about, you know, before uh, before COVID and, and still having the discussion at the level of the reading and not waiting until sort of the, the end analysis um, so yeah, from the researcher side, it was always about um, thinking out loud and, and discussing stuff as I was reading it before I get to the stage of writing an article or, or trying to you know, put it in the context of like a broader book project or whatever. Um, and then with my students, um, being able to, to you know, point them to specific passages and then see their reactions um, to specific passages. And so it's, it's a tool that, yeah, I will continue using um, you know, after COVID and after everything else. 
And then I just, I keep thinking of, of other use cases in other classes. Um, I'm working with uh, one class, it's actually in architecture, and they're doing a oral history project where they're um, taking all of these oral histories of Oklahoma City and they're coding for locations and um, affect uh, of those locations within the oral histories. And um, Hypothesis makes that really easy. You just highlight a thing and then you can, you know, enter in the, the geolocation or uh, description of the location that's mentioned. And so it's, um, you know, whether you're doing that asynchronously, synchronously, and face-to-face or online, um, the work still needs to be done and, uh, and Hypothesis makes it easy. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope, I know that I'll continue using it. I hope that the school continues using it. Um, the, the argument, I think, for the, the LMS integration, the, the cost to an, an institution um, being worth it, has to do with the fact that I'm, I'm this sort of weird professor who was seeking this tool for a long time and like an eager early adopter and happy to experiment and happy to um, deal with the discomfort of students when they're trying to get a new thing set up when it was a uh, hypothesis in the wild, right? And it, I could put up with that. There are so many of my colleagues who are more hesitant about using technology um, and who at the same time would um, complain about students not reading, would say, you know, I give them these assignments and I don't think they're reading them. And I, I think I could say to them, I don't think they're reading them either. Um, you don't have a good way yet to hold them accountable for reading, not only hold them accountable for reading, but give them a way to read in a, an engaging way. Like, you know, um, it's not about like replacing the quiz with the annotations. It's about giving them this experience of the value of reading. Um, and that's something that's going to be done with what they've come, uh, come up with during class. Um, it's not just that the professor is then going to lecture all the things that were in the reading. So the, the reason I'm sharing all of that is because um, the value I think to an institution is that the instructors who might be a little more hesitant to try won't have as many hurdles when using the integration into the LMS. Um, and I've talked to many who've given it a try. Um, they put up you know, a PDF, students annotated and they're blown away by the level of discussion that was occurring. And that's, that's a, the beginning of a flipping of the classroom, even if that instructor hadn't already drank the Kool-Aid of a student-centered classroom where the, there is no lecture, you're going to get drawn into that because you're going to see everything your students want to share. Um, so from the perspective of just professional development of faculty, I would say, um, I think it's, it's valuable there. And I don't think you'll have as much experimentation if you don't have the app in the LMS. There's a little humorous. Those are great points, I thought. Um, and uh, there's a little humorous chatter going on in the in the chat now about what's hanging on both of your walls. John has apparently the world's largest diploma. Well, maybe not. There could be people at, who have even larger diplomas because they have larger walls based on how he says it works. Um, Mary, what is what what is your uh, thing on your wall say? I have been so like self-conscious of my location for teaching because this is my mother's apartment. She'll be happy to know that this will be on the internet one day. Um, so I have told every class, especially in the fall, I was so hyper aware of this being in the frame that I would say to my students, can you guess what it is? Whoever guesses gets some kind of you know recognition. Um, are there any guesses? Nobody ever took me up on it. It never became like the, the buzzy thing in my class that I wanted it to be. But does anybody have a guess? This is giving there's little, me. There's a little bit of glare on it right now, so it's a little hard to see. Hey, I mean, this is basically like I gave yeah. you the perfect amount of glare to make this really hard nut to crack here. Um, if I were to tell you that this said, "What a word, word, wonderful world." Oh, okay. yeah. So is that from the song? Yeah, you could imagine that the decor choices of my mother might involve Louis Armstrong. Oh, I'm a big fan. Love that. Yeah. And so it guides our guides our day. <laughs> nice. Lovely. So that's what we've got going on. Thank you for asking that because yeah. I wanted somebody to talk to me about that since I started teaching here. <laughs> that was a yeah. very important question, Nate. Thank yeah. You for that. I have another follow-up question that's a little more serious too, if you if you will allow, Jeremy. Um, <laughs> thumbs up. Um, you, you guys may have heard, I'm going to throw a link into the chat here about um, the research project that Hypothesis has launched with the University of, or Indiana University, um, sort of uh, th 
thanks to a lot of guidance and work by our um, scholar in residence this year, Rami Kalir, who's at the University of Colorado Denver. Um, and this is uh, will be certainly near and dear to Mary's heart um, and John's too, I'm sure, because the research project is designed to explore exactly the kind of intersection between um, kind of first year uh, reading and writing experiences like in the composition and English uh, field. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, if you haven't heard about it yet, this blog post kind of um, lays it out. But if just given the context of your work, and I'll go to Mary first on this, um, would you say that you find, and I know you've addressed this a little bit already, but would you say that you find with your students that social annotation ends up being uh, something that empowers writing as much as reading? Is it both or is it is it mostly about just the reading? Well, the reading is the beginning of writing. And so in that regard, I mean, the way I teach writing is to em try to empower students to trust their impressions um, because in order for them to learn to develop original, original contributions to make to scholarly conversations, and that's what I'm driving at when I teach academic writing, then I need them to trust that their impressions upon reading something, whether it's a scholarly article or a work of literature, um, ha has value and not defer to my sense or whatever they can glean implicitly from class discussion about what's what am I supposed to know about this? And so I find student writing extremely stilted when they come in often from having, you know, been taught in whatever ways they have that there are wrong or right answers and that you have to, you know, convey certain um, knowledge of certain techniques. Um, I have to undo all of that. And social annotation helps me do that. Classroom discussion helps me do that. But social annotation shows them as it's occurring, the variety. Um, I used to be, I'm gonna go into the weeds on this, um, stop me if you need to redirect, but I used to be a little um, concerned about students being able to see each other's responses before class discussion, because I used to think that the power of the class was the moment when the student said, I kind of thought this, and then the student across the room said, I didn't respond that way at all. Um, but what I find, and in that moment, you can see the multiplicity of interpretations that are out there, and I can model in the front of the room, that could become an interesting claim, that could become an interesting claim, all of these things can be alive, and that's exciting. Um, I used to worry that having them all annotate together before class, they'd all just pile onto certain ideas, um, and I've experimented with that, I've had them keep their annotations private um, at first, and then share, um, share them in some way. Um, but the more I teach them and the more I talk to them about what it is they're doing, that they want to try to contribute something and not just jump on and say, I agree, or push them to say, I, I agree, but with a difference, or I disagree in this way. Um, all of that drives toward them developing claims that are arguable. It's absolutely crucial to the way that I teach writing. Yeah, I think that says it better than I could have. Um, but I did want to point out that the two biggest user groups at OU for Hypothesis are um, creative writing and um, and the history department. And so it's the, the two sides of that coin of um, annotating the historical texts that the history department is uh, are reading largely, and then the creative writing uh, using it to annotate. Um, I mean, all of our creative writing courses are taught using um, various sorts of literature. And so they have the students engage with that literature and then write off of it. Um, and so they're, they're marking up um, both what they're reading and what they're writing. And then in my own classes, um, history of science is largely um, populated with, for the students by um, pre-meds and by other sort of STEM majors. And so they take our courses and we're um, expected to help them learn how to communicate with each other uh, and how to write um, from a humanities perspective. And so Hypothesis is great in helping me get them to analyze texts, but also, yeah, start that process of um, writing collaboratively and individually. And so, yeah, I think it's a great transition tool um, in terms of seeing the connections between what you're reading and what you're writing. Um, and I, I actually wanna share something um, building on this because there's a, a, an activity that I built this semester that I think works exactly toward, I'm so excited about this research project, I didn't know about it, but um, I'm excited to learn about it. Um, one of the things, as I was just describing, having students respond initially and then helping them recognize that what they, 
what they first were thinking as they were reading can be the beginning of essentially a question that then they answer and that becomes their argument for their paper. Um, I've realized that they respond in such a, so many different kind of categorizable ways. Some respond with anecdote. You know, they say, this reminds me of this thing that happened to me one time. Some respond immediately with a claim. Some respond immediately to a text by saying, I would argue this about it. Some respond with questions. Some respond by having had a question and already answering it by looking something up, giving us a definition or a gloss on a term. And so when they do their first round of annotations and we come to class, I introduce the categories that I've come up with. And I ask them to go back and categorize what they've done and tag in that way. So we've been playing around with, with tagging and helping that essentially what that does is it helps me teach them the various components of building an argument that you need all of those things and that some of them come quickly to some people and some of them take longer, but they can watch what everybody else has done and see how they would categorize it. And then when I ask them to do another activity and I say, all I want here are objective observations like these are just that no one would disagree that this occurs in the text that's something that they can recognize what that is because they've tagged what they did before to see where other students were doing that is that making sense i don't know yeah that's super cool that's great I, i'm gonna um jump in here because we're a little bit over time but if uh people want to keep this discussion going that would be great. I just want to make, you know, be cognizant of people's actual time and if you have to jet anywhere. So it's up to you. Um, and again, also to um, people who came here today to see this, if you have to go, um, there will actually be a recording of this in the coming days, hopefully. So we'll reach out and um, share that with you. But uh, John and Mary, do you want to stay over a little bit, keep the discussion going? Just want to share a last thought. Uh, you just, I think you just I went the wrong way for me. <laughs> I saw you nodding. I, I unmuted myself to tell John that I thought he should go first because he seemed like he had something to say. <laughs> oh, I was, uh, um, so in addition to teaching history courses, um, I'm, the main thing I do is help everybody with their blogs here and uh, here at OU. And so I work on a lot of web and DH projects and I was just imagining different uh, ways of building this anthology, um, just using the hypothesis API and, um, and how you could have a sort of live updated table of contents with all the stuff that your students are annotating, just pulling straight off the hypothesis API. Um, and uh, and I, I was imagining the build on that. Um, I would love to hear what you're thinking about that because I you're talking about the project I was describing. Yeah, yeah, and just the way that you're using tags and the way that the students are are going out and collecting things, and, and you know whether that's directed by you or or sort of in the wild, as you said, um, by the students, um, you could just live pull off of a group's uh, tags, and then yeah, whether that's literally a tag cloud or um, sort of a an automated table of contents of all of the different pieces that they're pulling together, and then just linking out to wherever that is with the students' annotations, you know, sort of live on the web, but your whole like anthology could be a single web page that's just live updated, pointing out to all of these different resources that your students are collecting and annotating. Um, I like that a lot. Would you like to join the project, please, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I, could, I think I could still show you how to do that. It's been a little while since I played with the API. I was thinking that, uh, that John Udell could probably do this uh, uh, in his sleep, but um, when, yeah, think, uh, Mary, yeah. when Mary started this project, she's like, who's doing crazy, weird, like, funky stuff with a uh, hypothesis and I sent her an initial list and I don't think John was on there but I, I was a mistake John should have been on there he's always been I trying to break break the tool in all the best ways <laughs> yeah yeah I, I want to hear these ideas because actually a lot of the stuff I was thinking would be kind of using hypothesis and then building something that could be annotated with hypothesis later but not necessarily thinking about the tagging in that way so that's really helpful um and I, I'll be bothering you John you can expect it yeah, no problem. I, 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 um, I think Jeremy has probably um, beaten this horse uh, beyond death, but um, the metaphor of the, the mimics um, and the, the idea of um, showing our work as we read through lots of different sources and, and those connected paths. And it sounds like your anthology is, is very much in that vein. Um, and so, yeah, just being able to chart those paths around the web 
um, as they develop. And obviously the, the downside of, of that, of, of leaving things out on the web rather than collecting them into a single space would be, you know, if any of those resources stop being maintained or, or go down or right. whatever. Um, but that's something that, you know, a hurdle you could, you could jump into. I have a closing observation, which is that the, the blog post that I started off by quoting sort of suggested that, um, that the world, that people, that teachers are fatigued um, and just ready to return to normalcy and that there's gonna snap back to something that was before. Um, and that's not what's happening here, right? I see two educators here who have always been innovative, innovative continue to be innovative, uh, in some ways have been energized and, and more imaginative or, you know, that at least has continued through this difficult time. Um, so that's a, that's a very optimistic thing uh, for, for me to see um, that great teaching continues, uh, great teaching continues to evolve. Um, and we've, we've had a great conversation with two great teachers today and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, I wanna thank you too, this has been great. And maybe we have to think about there is no normal anymore and go forward with that notion and all. And maybe there never was. <laughs> maybe there never was. Yeah, exactly. So, okay, great. Well, uh, again, I want to thank you um, both for being here, Mary and John. This was a really great liquid margins. And um, thank you for everyone who showed up and everyone at Hypothesis. And again, there'll be a recording of this soon and we'll share that with you and join us again on liquid margins and again thank you for being here take care <laughs>